What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to the Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Hey guys, what's up? It's Jay Campbell and I'm making a quick commercial here for seercustom.com, my revolutionary cosmeceutical peptides company, co-founded with my business partner, Nick Andrews, who happens to be one of the world's top formulators. We have the revolutionary Oxano Grow, which completely regrew my hair. If you guys saw my hair about a year ago, I was almost bald. I even had the micropigmentation program from uh, Advantis. And now I've completely regrown my hair. That's just with version one. Version two is now in the marketplace or will be very, very soon. And it is three to five times as more effective than the current version or the original beta version of Oxano. We also have Royal Blue Serum and Sky Blue Cream, which will completely upgrade your face. I mean, I'm almost 50 years old. I have a pretty good complexion. I use it regularly. My wife swears by it. It will reduce fine lines and wrinkles, dramatically improve elasticity, and just the overall look and feel of your face. You feel great on both of them. You can also use them with red light therapy. There's all sorts of great stuff. So go to a seercustom.com. And if you're a first time customer, use the coupon J15 to take 15% off your purchase. I appreciate all you guys. And I send you tremendous love and light. So what's going on, everybody? It's Jay Campbell, of course, the founder of the Jay Campbell podcast. And I'm doing a podcast here today that I actually think is going to be probably my, my most important podcast I've ever done. I have my business partner, and longtime friends, Nick Andrews with the Sear Custom. And of course, one of my best friends in the whole world as a doctor, if I even have any, Dr. Rob Komenarik from RenewHealth.com. Gentlemen, how are you guys? Great. I got your back, man, for a lifetime. I know you do. And so does that guy up there. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, yeah. we're, we're entering the golden age. This podcast is part of how and why we're doing that. Let me just set this up real quick. Um, this podcast today, the purpose of this podcast today is literally to discuss how not just men, but women can be removed off of DHT inhibitors. Cause Rob, I had no idea how many women were on these things too. It's literally nuts, but um, to set everybody up, we will of course link to this in the podcast. You know, there are two profound articles that Nick wrote, Nick and I wrote together uh, with help from our copywriter, Tom Zakharov. He gets a shout out. Uh, that ran on Ben Greenfield's uh, website in the last two weeks. And then Nick and I also did a podcast with Ben, you know, truly essentially showing the reality of the world or showing the reality of hair loss and DHT inhibition to the world. And as you guys both know now, it's changing a lot of things. A lot of people are talking about it. You know, our business is exploding. We're seeing sequential growth. Um, Nick, let, let me have you just summarize real quick, extremely high level, um, why DHT inhibition does not work. Okay. Quick high level, 50,000 foot view. So if you uh, put on your nerd hat and you go digging through all the literature for the last 30, 40, almost 50 years, you, you see something interesting is that yes, DHT is involved in hair growth. Um, but there are plenty of examples um, from odd medical cases to looking at women, to looking at children that what it fundamentally comes actually down to at the end of the day is blood flow. So as soon as you inhibit blood flow to that area, uh, actually, honestly, any area of the body with hair bearing uh, follicles, um, you're going to experience hair loss. Um, is it DHT? Well, you can look and you'll see DHT in various parts of the human body at various ages in both men and women, and there's no impact on hair growth. So going through all that literature right there, what that shows us is DHT is not, is not the foundational cause. It is not the root cause of hair loss. Yes, it can contribute. Yes, it plays a role in hair loss. But, you know, Dr. Rob will get on this in a moment. You know, why are you going to go after, you know, one of the more important hormones in your body um, when it is not the causative factor of hair loss? Very well said. So, Rob, I'm going to jump into the next point. And this is all you. So with that said, why are DHT, and for the people who don't know what DHT means, it's dihydrotestosterone, why are DHT inhibitors band-aids? Man, 
<clears throat> DHT, right? Dihydrotestosterone. What a hormone that makes men men. It literally is what makes you a man right from the beginning as a fetus developing in the womb. When the two labia fuse together and the urethra is made, that's the responsibility of DHT. It literally is what makes you a man. And anything that you're going to take that can inhibit the production of dihydrotestosterone in its two forms is essentially stealing away your manhood. Why would Big Pharma ever want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> it's called money, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. So just tell, talk, look, go a little bit more deeper for the geeks that watch the Jay Campbell podcast um, on, you know, NR3, C4, the DHT complex. Yeah. And, so, you know, you know the androgen receptor, receptor, right? NR3, right. C4, the androgen receptor, DHT combined makes that antigen receptor DHT complex that engages the cell that causes all the great things that DHT does, right? And energizing the cell and energizing a man's body. <clears throat> inhibiting that is literally stealing the essence of what makes you a man and why on earth you would want to do that. Uh, sure, there's pharmaceutical reasons. There are, from certain perspectives, medical reasons why you would want to use those, though in my opinion, those are limited. So right. if the perspective is I'm a man with severe BPH and I can't urinate, these medications can be used to offset that to help, right? There's combinations of DHT inhibitors with tamsulosin, for example, that can that can be really life-saving in a sense. But in my opinion, they're medications that are used in the interim till we can get to the new more advanced procedures that are being done by many of the interventional radiologists these days to alleviate BPH permanently so that men don't have to be on these medications. From the sense of hair, yeah. I see the use of DHT blockers for hair and follow me on this is purely egoic. Right. Right. It's not spiritual. Right. It's not your hair isn't what makes you a man. No. no. So the use of a DHT inhibitor to try and prevent hair loss from the spiritual sense, hundred percent egoic. And it's, it's an, a man living from ego. That if he thinks this is what makes him a man, if this is what makes him attractive to a woman, way off base. Man, I got so spiritual, I blew Jay off the, off the screen. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that because, you know, you have the red pill community, right? And they, they like to dig into all their research. If you dig into the attractiveness studies, bald males almost always rank in the very top of the group. <laughs> and, and it's really the lower mind of a man and that egoic nature that's attached to this. And you know, we all know there's genetic reasons there's, and most of it's inflammatory, inflammatory lifestyle. So not exercising, eating poor foods, cakes, cookies, candies, chips, and sodas, being overweight, stress, psychological reasons there and genetic as to why you may or may not maintain hair, but an inflammation of the scalp, aging, right? So loss of the, the, the aponeurosis that holds that hair follicle and it can't hold its base. There are multiple reasons as to why men lose their hair. But so in my opinion, has, going down that pathway of going to DHT inhibitor to, to want to maintain your hair is purely egoic. Okay, so but let's ask the important question and you guys can both chime in and I'll go to Nick first. I mean, why did Big Pharma, knowing because they're not stupid? Oh, they knew uh, exactly. So, but but what was the? Is it, it? I mean, again, I hate saying this, and we, you know, it's like, the bullseye is always the same. But is this a money endeavor that they could get guys addicted physiologically, psychologically? Because we know it attaches to the androgen receptor in the scalp. We know that there's a psychogenic effect because it is impacting the brain in all the various pathways. I mean, Rob, and I want you to speak on this and Nick, you too, but like, you know, I'm very open about this. I have lost two friends to post finasteride syndrome. If you remember, Dr. John was very outspoken about it too. This is not spoken about in the medical community in the way that it should be. And it's insane that there are that many people. I saw data, dude, that said there's more than 25 million people in the United States using these things. 25 
million. I, I believe so, it. Yeah. And, and again, how many of these patients are told what you and me and Nick are talking about today? And so that's what I really want you to talk about is I want you to talk about the deleterious effects and the downstream effects of being on these drugs. They're literally toxic. So uh, let me answer your first question, Jay. Go ahead. So people understand why the pharma world is as much of a mess as it is. The average person is like, oh, a drug is on the market because it's going to help everybody and it's safe. Wrong answer. Um, that's not why it's on the market. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it really boils down to a combination of big pharma uh, fundamentally, you know, being held to the fire by uh, Wall Street. They have to get the same quarterly reports as everybody else. And then you combine that with the regulatory environment. Um, you know, and there are two aspects to the regulatory environment. The first being, can you tie it up with intellectual property with IP? If you can't tie a compound up with intellectual property, it's not viable from an economic perspective. And then from a regulatory perspective, it's also intentionally positioned in a very specific way, which is really a whole nother discussion. So you have these, you can have the, the best brains come up with the best uh, cures in the world. Um, but essentially, it's got to go through the finance guys first. Is this viable? Um, the average drug can cost anywhere from about $750 million to uh, $2 billion to get to market. It fluctuates a little bit over time. So, you know, when you're the money guys, you're the CEO, you're there, you know, the board, the investors, the first question is, okay, we're going to spend a billion dollars to get this to market. Can we make a billion dollars off of it? Well, if you're not in the right regulatory slot in the right place and you can't get the right IP around your therapy, your treatment, your drug, then the answer is no. It, you're not going to do anything with it. It's getting locked up in a file cabinet somewhere, and that's the end of it. So from that perspective, the reality is, regardless of the propaganda, you actually don't care about the side effects. What you care about is the statistical analysis of your proposed therapy, your proposed drug, is can you show a statistically significant effect without life-threatening side effects. And then they play definitions, you know, definition games with that all day long. So, you know, classic example, everybody knows is statins. If you actually do a deep dive in statins, on average, depending on how you, you know, how you see the numbers calculated, they may add a few hours to your life statistically without accounting <laughs> to the side effects. If you account for the side effects, they statistically shorten your life. But, you know, once again, you combine the, you know, the Wall Street quarterly report aspect with the regulatory aspect and how much it costs to get the market and having to make money again. Um, don't care. So it's insane. literally insane. So Rob, so what are the deleterious? Thank you, Nick. What are the deleterious effects? I mean, you see this every day in your practice. You've been seeing this for what a decade plus a long time. Un unfortunately, the vast majority of uh, men that I see are pretty young. It's, it's not older men. I'm talking 40 and younger, 35 and younger, a lot in their 20s, even in their older teens, uh, probably 12 to 15, 16 individuals a year I send out for penile implants Jeez. under the age of 40. Insane. Having used uh, one of the DHT blockers, and the most common one out there, right, is finasteride. And... Uh, it, it's really sad to see a 20 something year old who now is unable to generate an erection because of the DHT inhibition and the destruction of the receptor or atrophy of the receptor, whatever the exact mechanism that may be that's causing the problem. And I'll go every pull every bag out of my all the tricks out of my bag that I can to try and get back their erectile quality. And often it's just not possible. They're truly sad, sad cases. And then, you know, finasteride, the DHT blockers, they pass the blood brain barrier. I know. And directly affect oligodendrocytes. And DHT is very prolific in the brain. Right. And uh, it can be produced on demand. Uh, all the other neurosteroids, uh, pregnenolone, pregnanolone, allopregnanolone, get interfered with the, the volumes of the brain that right. these 
metabolites that are responsible for keeping you calm. And finasteride can directly interfere with the production of these because it crosses the blood brain barrier. And you'll see mood disturbance disorders, severe depression. Anxiety, it's incredible. Uh, and, and literally uncontrollable at times. Uh, my heart goes out to these individuals that are put on these medications and never given any kind of fair warning no, as to the no. degree of erectile dysfunction, no. impotence, uh, mood instability, uh, uh, gynecomastia. You'll see thickening and darkening of facial hair, which, you know, most guys will be oh, like, great, like my beard looks better. <laughs> um, but then you, you look at the prostate cancer prevention trial back in 2004, which showed that, you know, men on uh, DHT blockers, it hides prostate cancers. And when right. it's they diagnosed, they're much more aggressive cancers. So to me, there's a lot. If a doctor, a physician, nurse practitioner is going to prescribe a DHT blocker, they better damn well understand what this thing can do. And Rob, they don't. And I want to talk deeper about that. So. Again, you know, I have two guys that killed themselves from post finasteride syndrome. It's a very real, understood psychologi psychological, psychogenic, whatever you want, called phenomenon. And we're going to get into this a little bit later. You know, I'll prep that just a little bit. The male identity lives in the pelvis. Yeah, exactly. You're you're literally stealing a man if, if this medication goes awry. Rob, as you know, and I won't share the person's name, but a very influential person FaceTimed me yesterday. And, you know, he wants to know the ins and outs of Oxano Grow. And, you know, I'm on 2.5 of Propecia for blank. And again, you know, there are millions of men and freaking women out there utilizing these drugs. And what I wanted to say to both of you, and Nick, you can comment on this because you know this was in the article we wrote this. There, this is so screwed up with our culture, but the majority of men and women would take sexual dysfunction and depression over losing their hair. It's That's crazy. how screwed up we are. There's studies on this. They have science on this. So, so I mean, like, where are we? Because, Rob, you already mentioned it. Doctors Pure vanity and in, in ego. Right. But doctors are not, okay. Yes, of course. It's all vanity and ego, but doctors and not you, but most doctors are not informing their patients of the secondary and the downstream effects of these drugs. And again, I want to ask you as a physician and Nick, I want you to comment what, okay, so let's compare this to, a, to AIs, to aromatase inhibitors and that game that you and I have been playing for close to half a decade. Like it's the same shit. You know that, you know, estradiol has to be produced from the, you know, the aromatization of testosterone into estrogen, right? And if it's not and inhibited, we have all these deleterious effects, obviously, because estrogen confers protection as a pleiotropic hormone, blah, blah, blah. You've done that. We've done that a hundred times, but it's the same thing. We're, 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 we're on the same argument. It's the same story. And not enough people know about this. And so I'm telling you, you already know this. You guys know this is the first podcast that I think has ever been done on this subject matter in this classification because men and women need to be aware of what they're doing to their health. They are harming themselves using these drugs. <clears throat> well, so Go ahead, Dr. Rob. I was going to say that uh, it, it's very interesting. I DHT blockers are one of the medications that really prolifically scare me to use because you can have unwanted side effects that are permanent exactly. and very, very quickly. Now, have I used them in the past? I have. And fortunately, I've never had uh, bad side effects. I have patients that have been on it 20 years. And for those patients that are on them and have been on them and never had an issue and they've been on it for a decade plus... I tell them just stay on it. <laughs> just don't, let's not even let's not even come off of it. There's no problem. Let's not remove it. Create one. Um, the, the DHT blockers actually scare me, especially in younger individuals. Not so much in an older individual with severe prostate problems who's in their sixth, seventh, eighth decade. Uh, but now that we have procedures that we can use, uh, interventional radiologic procedures that we can use to shrink prostatic tissue to create appropriate urine flow, uh, there's much better options that are exist right now. 
it, it compared to aromatase inhibitors, you know, aromatase inhibitors, the deleterious effects of those happen over time. Right. I'm not going to put somebody on an aromatase inhibitor to gain control of a situation over a three to four to six week period and cause harm. Not going to. And a lot of doctors will prescribe aromatase inhibitors for men based on the Harvard studies, you know, for increasing testosterone, but never really looking at the deleterious long-term effect on aromatase inhibitors, how it affects endothelial function and bone and mineral metabolism and brain function. But with the DHT inhibitors, it's literally one dose can cause the problem. Permanent side effects. And I've seen it and it's scary. So before you speak, Nick, what what do you think? And you don't know, because like you said, you wouldn't even attempt to withdraw. But like, what do you think is happening potentially to guys that have been on them for 20 years who don't ever know? It's a good question. With the men that have been on, you know, and it comes down to genetics. There's going to be individual genetics here at play as well. There are some men, literally, you can put them on enormous doses of testosterone. They'll never have a single unwanted right. side effect right. ever. Right. Uh, almost like they're Neanderthal in nature. It's just everything good happens and nothing bad. And there's those individuals you could put on it and nothing bad will ever happen. They'll never have erectile dysfunction. They'll never have ejaculatory problems. They'll never have any kind of issue with mood instability whatsoever. Then you'll have uh, uh, some 20-year-old dealing with now literally two pills. He hasn't felt right in his brain since. It's been a year. He's had zero erections off of two pills. Yeah, and he probably goes homicidal. I mean, not homicidal, but you know, suicidal ideation at some point. These 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 young men uh, become desperate, and it's it's really a scary situation to deal with. And I I would call it life threatening. Okay, so we're going to talk to you in a second about withdrawing men off of DHT inhibitors as it relates to scalp. But Nick, your your thoughts and comments on all of this? Well, if you so the way I look at it is if you, you know, we're all, you know, in this group, uh, you know, part of well into optimization, you know, what's the point of that? Fundamentally, it's to optimize the aging process. You know, we all kick the bucket at some point, but the question is, how do you get there, right? That's why we all optimize. Um, and you start looking at hormone balancing, you know, what what is the one of the bigger things of optimization, keeping your hormones balanced? The second you start introducing exogenous uh, hormone blocking compounds, you know, if nothing else, you know, to Dr. Rob's point, it can happen in a hundred different ways. But fundamentally, you just accelerated your aging process. Um, you know, it could be through a hundred different mechanisms, but um, you're virtually guaranteed. You know, actually, Dr. Rob, if you ever have a chance with some patients, this would be interesting. You can do the genetic age testing now. Um, it would actually be interesting to take some guys who've been on it, you know, and compare it to guys of similar, we'll say, optimization or physiological backgrounds. I would suspect that you're going to see a jump in uh, genetic age. That would be an interesting study to conduct to get to get a small co- cohort of men together and uh, see what that would what that data would look like yeah. because it would stand to reason. You're literally blocking the very hormone. That- <laughs> Make a man. Well, so yeah. also if you think about it from a system's perspective, your body is always working to maintain homeostasis. So you've now, uh, you know, applied this exogenous push on your system. So now your body is always pushing back on that. It, it's like an engine. You know, if you drive with your foot on the accelerator, even if it, you're just on the brake a little bit, but you're always on that brake a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, for five miles, you're fine. Uh, after you know 500 miles, you destroyed your brakes. Just that wear and tear is always there and going to build up. Well said. Yeah, very well said. Okay, so in the in the context of we now know that hair loss is due to blood flow to the scalp. Bottom line, you know what is the restriction? Many causations of you know issues in the scalp causing poor blood flow: microinflammation, systemic inflammation. You know type two diabetes, other diseases, anything related to, you know, screwing up a person's blood flow, which is obviously lifestyle oriented, you know, you're living fully inflamed, uh, metabolically dysregulated, dysfunctional, whatever. What is going to be Rob, the easiest way to withdraw a man who's been on, you know, 
for the guys that have been on younger guys under 40, who've been on very short term, whose doctors, you know, put them on this, then they were using minoxidil or whatever other bullshit that doesn't work and attaches to the follicles in the cell. What is the easiest way that you would withdraw a man off of this that will prevent as maximally as possible? And I probably, you, I know Nick will speak to it, but we probably should say it's going to be a roll of the dice that you're not going to have some of your follicles die, you know, because they've already been killed by the DHT inhibition. But what is the best way to do this? Because this is going to be important. There are going to be hundreds of thousands of men and women in the, maybe millions in the rest of this year coming forward to guys like us asking us, how do I do this? Yeah. So great question. And the approach I take is very individual based on what symptoms or lack thereof that they're having. So the best way is to do, do a slow wean, regardless of who it is. Uh, I'll generally wean them slowly off the medication. More often than not, guys will come in and they're usually on finasteride one milligram a day. So uh, that's, I'll, by the way, that's insane. Yeah. Uh, it, it, and if they're having problems, I, I want to get them off as quickly as possible. And then I want to get their DHT levels up as high as possible to try and reverse some of the uh, unwanted side effects, which is generally erectile dysfunction and ejaculatory dysfunction. So then the mood disorders, uh, you'll see those as well, too, uh, usually severe depression or, or uncontrollable anxiety uh, and, getting con and getting control of that, which often it may be weaning the, the finasteride away from them slowly over a period of uh, <clears throat> a month or two to help alleviate the symptoms. Uh, like mood instability with anxiety, I generally like to use pregnenolone. Uh, which will get converted to allopregnanolone, allopregesterone, allopregnanolone, the volumes of the brain. I may use an SSRI because there can be <clears throat> loss of slow serotonin, slow serotonin reuptake transporter protein that's causing the issue um, and the lack of DHT in the brain itself. So I, I may use testosterone transdermal. I may use an orally rapidly dissolving tablet. I may use injectable or a combination of thereof to get higher DHT levels to really saturate the receptors again. Uh, the exact mechanism of what's occurring at the cellular level, whether it's uh, androgen receptor atrophy from not being engaged by the DHT because there's no more production because their levels were 30 or 40, which isn't high. Right. You know, and now it's five, you know, where the healthy 26 year old, you're going to see DHT levels. 60, 70, 80, right? Sometimes a hundred. I can take men and put them on a transdermal testosterone and usually scrotal. And the right. amount of the uh, uh, alpha reductase enzyme, I, the isoenzyme type, and there's three types, one through three, type one in the skin. And you'll get conversion to DHT, somewhere between 30 and 70% conversion from the skin. I've seen DHT levels, seven, 800 no hair loss. Right. 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 And then you'll have some guy with metabolic syndrome whose DHT is 10 testosterone is in the <laughs> toilet and their hair is falling out and clump. Of course. Oh, no blood flow. But they're inflamed as all get out. Exactly. No blood flow. No it, blood blood blood. Funny so, talking about sexual health and not to jump back to the beginning of this, but since you kind of mentioned it, you know, DHT creams are used for women's sexual health, right? So, uh, you know, applied in the uh, pelvic region where, you you know, you, you have natural body hair. Um, yeah, find me one woman who's ever had to stop getting a bikini wax or uh, we'll say maintenance of the area because she was using a DHT cream. Right. So, yeah, I'm guessing DHT isn't really going to hurt that hair follicle. Mm -mm. Right. No, it actually gets thicker, darker, and coarser. As yeah. well. Hey, guys, what's going on? It's Jay Campbell. Quick commercial for the optimized tribe with us navy seal michael jaco and i every monday night at 6 p.m pacific standard time there is not a single group online where you will get the highest level intel that michael and i can provide you from mastering intuition to fully optimizing your hormonal health to improving your fitness to raising your vibration and increasing your consciousness there isn't a single group online with two dudes like michael and myself 
helping people become the best version of their self. It's literally $99 a month and you get a 90 minute call with me and Michael every single Monday night. Don't wait another second. Sign up now at the link, theoptimizedtribe.com. I appreciate you guys and I send you tremendous love and light. So, so right. if I'm watching this podcast right now, you guys are blowing it out of the water. This is amazing. We're 28 minutes in. And again, this has never been done. And I'm a bro and I'm taking one to two and a half milligrams. Again, that very famous person is on two and a half milligrams a day, oh. right? For 10 plus years. He's still got, you know, his hair. But what he just heard your answer, Rob. But like in his mind, like, Doc, what am I going to feel like? Like, am I going to feel a lot better while you're doing this? Like, what is the time frame? I know you're giving me a ballpark, but like, how long is this going to take? Because this is the question these guys are going to be asking. And I wish I had an answer for that because it's very individualistic. Right. There's no cookie cutter to this. It's no. not like, no. oh, uh, uh, let me go to XYZ clinic and this is the protocol and this is how it works and it's guaranteed that this right. is how you're going to feel. If you're one of those men that is on a DHT blocker and you're not having any unwanted symptoms, erectile dysfunction, ejaculatory dysfunction, mood instability, uh, anxiety, depression, <clears throat> chances are you're going to be just fine. I would still do a slow wean. Right. Uh, I wouldn't abruptly stop the medication. But if you're having symptoms, how you're going to feel afterward is going to be dependent on a molecular level. How well is that androgen receptor going to be engaged by DHT? Yeah. One of the things that I found in treating men with post-finasteride syndrome is getting their DHT levels as high as possible, as quickly right. as possible. And usually I use a combination of therapies. But the whole mechanism behind what draws erectile quality is very complex. It's a combination of vascular, neurologic, physiologic, molecular, uh, psychogenic factors, which involves several neurotransmitters, you know, dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, uh, nitric oxide, endothelial and neuronal nitric oxide, uh, melanocyte stimulating hormone, which I've had good success sometimes using. Uh, 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 melanotan too to help yeah. drive libido back, right? Because it stimulates yeah. libido and it can stimulate spontaneous actions. And then there's PT-141 in combination with taking the DHT levels as high as you can get them. But also addressing thyroid issues. Uh, what's their prolactin oxytocin doing? Right. Because that, right. that also affects it. And then estrogen levels. Because sometimes these guys, they come in an aromatase inhibitor and, and <laughs> right? So they're getting whacked on both sides and they have zero erectile quality and their estrogen is like less than, you know, their estradiol is less than five, their DHT is less than 10. And they're like, I can't get an erection to save my life. And it's like, well, shocker. Uh, so depending on what the issue is, the age of the individual, it, it, treatment is going to vary. Um, you, Question for us to be able to work with somebody who can can open up the financial wheelhouse a little bit because I'm going to tell you it's not inexpensive to get things corrected and it's not a guarantee. You know, By the like way, how much how much does it cost? Guys, a year out for for implants. I mean, so I, I don't even want to. I don't want to talk about that. Go ahead, Dick. <laughs> Dr. Rob, well, you know, obviously, I, I'm I'm not a doctor. I'm just a professional nerd. Would you uh, focus more on uh, transdermal creams in cases like that, just given the, the difference in the pharmacokinetics, especially uh, scrotal creams, because you're you're you know you're uh, hitting that whole mechanism like big time. Yeah, you know, that's exactly, you know, and that's exactly right because I want to get the DHT levels as high as I can to start to saturate those receptors, and the best way to do that is going to be through a transdermal and applied scrotally. So what about the guys though that are not, and this is this guy, what about the guys not using therapeutic testosterone who are on this high levels of DHT? I mean, how can they not have side effects? I don't believe any of it, but you're right. You say that some of these guys don't. And they don't. And that comes down to individual genetics. Not everyone's going to suffer the deleterious uh, unwanted side effects of a particular medication, no matter what it is. There's always going to be those people that take a medication, do just fine. And then there's always going to be that small subset that, that has problems. Unfortunately, the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry and the makers of, of the DHT blockers hit that information. They, they manipulated and hid the fact. Yeah. You know, there was a pretty large majority of men in their, in their studies that actually had you know, erectile and impotence 
uh, uh, ejaculatory problems and mood disorders. That, so, that's how it was hidden. Can you imagine it's what man industry. would date? Hold on, a Nick, Nick. How many men would actually agree to a, a script of that if that was revealed? Go ahead, Nick. Dude, gone. I don't well, so care. There are two pieces there, right? The average doctor, you know, they have to see however many patients it is a day to hit, you know, their metrics. Otherwise, you know, shit rolls downhill for them. They have issues to deal with. So the way the system is set up, you know, it's unfortunate because unless somebody's really driven to spend the time to educate themselves, not relying on, you know, uh, information you're just being spoon fed, basically you're, all you're getting is the AMA or the FDA, uh, you know, you know, uh, short on whatever the uh, the therapy or the drug is, and you know, good luck, you know, finding potentially other views in that small set of data. You have, you know, twenty minutes while you're eating a sandwich to read. Right. Even if, if that, it usually what drives it from a physician standpoint. It's sad to say, because all these metrics that have to be followed if you're employed through a hospital system, you've got to see X number of patients a day. Same. All the metrics that are, are monitored are ridiculous. You can't even pry. You're just you're really just a data monkey for an insurance company anymore. So when do you when do you actually have the time to learn about a particular medication and, and it's either positive or negative effects on the human body? And you can just look at uh, um, the phosphodiesterase inhibitors, type five inhibitors alone. You know, if I go if I was to go into the standard family medicine office, say I had, geez, I'm having trouble getting erections and having connection with my wife. They go, oh, here, here you go. Here's some tadalafil. Right. Go home. What investigations right. been done? If right. I'm saying I have, I'm yeah. half erectile quality, don't you want to get a penile ultrasound first to understand what the problem is? You know, is it arterial? Is it vascular occlusive? Is it a combination of the two? Who does those studies anymore? You know? Um, so, pro you go and say, hey, my hair is falling out. You're going to get a knee-jerk reaction. You're going to get stripped for pro and say, hey, go. Part of the no one's going to sit down and talk about, hey, what would you have for breakfast? Uh, right. Captain Crunch. <laughs> <laughs> What's your body fat? Rob, and, Rob we had yeah, a guy we, we we had, we had send us. Minutes of cardio. So, dude, we had a customer service issue. Nick knows about this. That I'll just mention, you know, no names, of course, but. The guy said he used Oxano for five months and he said he got zero results, right? And so, of course, now I get involved and I send an email and I have like five standard questions. And the guy literally writes me and Nick back and says, I'm in perfect health. Uh, I'm a type two diabetic and my A1C is seven. Yeah. I'm in perfect health on a type two diabetic with a seven A1C. Yeah. But that's where the American public and really the global public is, as you said, because the people that they see, they don't see Dr. Robs. They see just garden variety emergency care docs who, like you said, have no you know time, no education, really. And so that guy literally thinks that he is in perfect health as a healthy diabetic. And, and it's crazy. And this is a whole nother show. But the normalization of metabolic syndrome in men right. is ridiculous. That right. this is some normal status of male health is to have right. metabolic syndrome. That's insane. insane crazy to, to where somebody now has incorporated into their thinking that having a hemoglobin A1C of seven <laughs> is normal. You're a rotting corpse. That's what I wanted to tell the guy. You're, like, you're, oh. you're uh, this far away from, you know, yeah. the right. big, the big one. Uh, exactly. It's, it, it, it's about it, a heart attack, not an arrest. Right. Right. And, and, you know, the, and, and the point here is not to attack doctors, but you know, it, it, would you go to a trainer at the gym? Uh, you know, who didn't clearly have some respectable physique and, you know, actually went to the gym, you know, for me, it's, it's the same thing. If I went to a doctor asking about my health, Hey, uh, you know, maybe I'm having performance issues, hair issue, whatever, or heart issues, whatever your issue is. And, you know, the doctor might make it up a flight of stairs without a break. Maybe right. not. Like you've got to kind of start asking questions because, you know, it, right. This may not be comfortable for people to realize, but wherever you are personally, you know, and we'll say in your life status and your health status, impacts your perspective of everything. If I'm overweight, sick all the time, can barely make it up a flight of steps, well, you know, that we all have challenges, right? It's not that big a deal. So, you know, if if I'm in that condition giving you health or medical advice, 
you got to ask some questions. Right. Yeah. That's normal. Well, I'm glad you said that, Rob, because that is, we will do another podcast, all three of us on that again. But I mean, this guy and Nick, you know, can, can, sh can share with you, but I want Nick to talk about DHT withdrawal and what happens to the follicles so we can be clear on that. And then we'll jump into what you want to finish with the spirituality section. Dr. Rob is now spiritual people. <laughs> Um, no, but no, but it, no, I know you always have. I been, shifted. You're, you're coming <laughs> out, bro. You're coming out on the JK. I'm not apartment. being so quiet about my belief in exactly. God. I've had enough, exactly, and that's why you and I have always been boys because we are all three men of God. But anyway, back to what I was just saying. Like the reality is, is that they have made people believe that right metabolic dysfunction, dysregulation, being obese is is not only healthy. It's like the new normal. And so people don't even know when they don't have good blood flow or they don't even know what like actual health means anymore. It's so absurdly bizarre. Have you seen the most recent uh, Victoria's Secret makeover? Yeah. Yeah. I saw that because you sent it to me. I almost died. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Dude, it, it, I thought it was a joke at first. I, I, I thought it was a meme. Well, since Rob is with us now, we all know what's happening. The fallen angels have taken over the society. We're dealing with demons. That's where we're at. Okay, so Nick, finalize this, and then we'll get into Rob's. We'll end on the best place, which is spirituality and our you know, speaking about God and the importance of why we're here. But like, what is happening when you withdraw a person off of a script like minoxidil or finasteride? Like, what is the risk to their hair follicles dying? Because that's the question that I'm getting. Right. So to Dr. Rob's point, it's going to vary from person to person. You will see the full spectrum. You're going to see some people who will probably have noticeable um, and potentially significantly increased hair loss. Um, you'll have, you know, it, realistically, it'll, it'll be a bell curve. On one extreme end, you're going to have a small percent of men who are probably going to see significant, um, you know, highly notable increased hair loss. On the other end of the bell curve, you'll see people who don't have any impact in the middle where most people will be. You're going to see a you know, it, it'll vary. Um, you may not see additional loss. You may see, you know, decreased quality of hair, any number of combination of factors, because you have to realize, as we mentioned before, as Dr. Rob was talking about, it's essentially almost like withdrawal of anything, whether it's uh, a hormone an exogenous drug your body has been pushing back against that DHT blocker the entire time you're on it. Now suddenly you pull it out. Your body's still pushing back against it. Um, how quickly your body gets back to a homeostasis point is going to depend on any number of factors from your state of health, your stress levels, your psychological state. Um, you know, how's your diet, you know, your genetics on and on and on. But realistically, for most people, you probably will see, we'll say, a degradation of your hair condition, at least for a short period of time. Hypothetically, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm certainly not making any medical claims here. If you just look at how Oxana works, realistically, um, you would definitely want to be on something like that that's going to support your current uh, state of follicle health, because coming off the DHT blockers is essentially increasing the stress that are on the cellular systems that underlie follicle health. So, you know, how long does that state of stress last? You know, think of it like a thunderstorm coming in, right? Um, you get off DHT blockers, the storm's coming in, man. Um, so, you know, how long that lasts is going to depend on a whole host of factors. But at that point, you know, if let's take the average person who's on these compounds coming off them. When you plan on coming off them, if you really want to minimize the impacts, uh, you know, basically plan on op optimizing, you know, that, as much as you can, you know, dial your diet in, get start getting your exercise up, all these things, you know, look at your stress levels, your mental state, because the better you address all these, and, you know, these are things obviously you can do on your own. You don't need to go see a doctor or this or that, you know, go see Dr. Rob. He'll, he'll do more for you than almost anybody else, but you know, there, there are quite a few things you can do to support yourself, but you have to know to do them. So great answer. Last question related to that. And both of you guys can take a stab for that guy who's late fifties, early sixties. He's been on a DHT blocker, Propecia for an asteroid a long time, and he has no side effects. Is it okay for him 
to start using oxanogrow concomitantly with the DHT inhibitor and what kind of results did a person like that expect to use? Because obviously we're all for, you know, for most people withdrawing, gradually doing it the way Rob recommends, but is it okay, you know, and I'll, maybe I'll ask you first, Nick, to use it while on DHT. Is he going to get worse results or less results in somebody who's not? So you know, we've had some interesting conversations around this because, and we've tried to be very careful because we don't want anybody getting the wrong idea of feeling they've been misled. Realistically, if you've had success with DHT blockers, Oxano may actually even magnify your results more because fundamentally Oxano is working to you know improve the state of blood flow, the mitochondrial state of the hair follicles. So you know you you can get a combinatory effect in some people. You know, but they have to realize if you're going to come off the DHT, you know, the Understanding all the variables can be difficult. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Rob has seen this a lot. Hey, I'm on this therapy. Um, you know, you're helping me because I messed up my knee. Um, your patient comes in six weeks later. Hey, Nick, how's your knee? Well, my knee still hurts. And you look at me and you're like, right, but you can bend down. I just saw you bend down. And in six weeks ago, you couldn't do that. So I think it's actually improving. Oh, yeah, it is. Oh, you're right. Same sort of thing. Um, I stopped using DHT blockers and holy cow, like, you know, I'm losing a little bit of hair now when I wasn't before this or that. Okay, great. Um, but what would happen if you weren't on Oxano as well to, you know, help your, maintain the health of those follicles while you're in that transitory period, however long it lasts. Rob, you want to add anything to that? I would agree with many of the things that, that Nick has stated. I would suspect that if you're on a DHT blocker and <clears throat> you've been maintaining hair and you were to use Oxano Grow, I would suspect that you're going to see additional benefit. Will everyone? Yeah. You know, probably not. There's always going to be outliers, but I would suspect that you will do well. If you come off a DHT blocker, there may be a period of time where you lose a little bit of hair as there's some adjustment. To coming off the blocker um then there's always other flat factors stress is a big one uh, and, and then uh, inflammatory state so cleaning up your nutrition getting off the cakes the cookies the candies the chips the soda the alcohol huh. which is a huge one you know i always like oh i only drink two three beers a night <laughs> come on you're not taking your health seriously Right. So, uh, getting off all the inflammatory and then taking care of chronic infections, chronic low grade inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction. It's right. interesting how many times I'll treat men or women for that matter for low grade infections. They've had multiple viral bacterial infections, cleaning things up, candida infections, getting rid of chronic inflammation, cleaning up their lifestyle and their nutrition. Adding in something like MOTC to generate more mitochondrial density, right? And maybe I've used PRP for some other reason, and they'll go, you know what? I've noticed my hair seems thicker. Yeah. Well, I was just going to ask you that. One of those particular modalities, it's the combination of, say, getting their thyroid corrected and using some mitochondrial products, so alpha lipoic acid, some MOTC. It's getting their lifestyle. Uh, uh, corrected and all of a sudden it's synergistic effect of these things and you see right hair right starting well, to well, it's, it's yeah, funny it's to say funny. that Nick and I are developing a, we're developing a supplement along those lines. Okay so look I'm, I'm just putting this up here I'm just I'm just putting this up here. We can we can even we can say recommended by Dr. Rob Nick in the supplement and me. There you go. Okay, but those are the strategies. We'll bring Rob and Nick back and uh, we'll do a podcast on how to actually maximize the growth of the hair because Rob does a lot of exosomes and PRP and I want to talk about that in his experience because he can, but that's not what we want to talk about. We want to talk about this to end the show. Hmm. Okay. So all three of us are men of God. So if you guys are not men of God and you're scientists and God doesn't exist, you can eject the podcast right now. I don't <laughs> think I have many of those people. Eject. But uh, Go ahead. This is all yeah. you, Rob. So, you know, what's really interesting uh, in my work in dealing with men 
which didn't start out this way because most of it was hormone based, but a lot of men come in and the reason why they're here isn't brain fog or fatigue or, or gaining weight around the middle. It's erectile quality. Right. And they go, geez, you know, my erections aren't as strong or I'm not having erections. I don't have nocturnal erections anymore. I've got no libido. And so by default, I started treating more and more erectile dysfunction over the years to the point now where the vast majority of men, I'd say in the last six to seven years, the amount of erectile dysfunction I see is it, it's enormous. It's enormous in its magnitude of how, how many men are suffering from poor erectile quality. And that led to me doing more investigative work of what else could be done besides the pumps, the constrictive devices, uh, the medications, hormone replacement, extracorporeal shockwave therapy, exosomes, PRP, you know, making sure these men actually had uh, penile ultrasounds to get an accurate diagnosis. What are all these things that can be done before they end up with either some vascular surgery or penile implant? Because erectile quality, erectile function, it's a disease that doesn't, there's no cure. You have to manage it. Otherwise, it continues to degrade. So whatever we can do to rectangularize that, to stop the degradation of erectile quality. And what I found in my connection to God and in listening to these men is often they come in in spiritual crisis. And as men, we don't really talk about what we've been traumatized by. And we've all been traumatized to some. Oh, yeah. And most often it's in childhood. Some, some men literally had to fight the devil himself because of being right. molested and raped and just the horrific things right. that have happened to him. And others, not so much. But what I found is that many men do suffer some form of trauma. And in our Magnum protocol, we address from a spiritual aspect the trauma that they've suffered. Now, we all, you know, we can be living from our heart, we can be living from our upper mind, or we can be living from the lower mind. And the lower mind lives in our pelvis. And the male identity lives in the pelvis. And oftentimes when we're living from the lower mind, that egoic mind, and we're taking our traumas and hurts and injuries and stuffing it on top and creating all this pelvic congestion, we negatively impact erectile quality. And so in my protocols, we work on the spiritual aspect of clearing out the lower mind so that the spiritual aspect can really start to take charge because the, the identity of the man lives in the pelvis. And when you can connect with that identity, you can really improve erectile quality for a lot of these men. As long as there isn't some vascular insult, right? Some overwhelming medical problem. More often than not, I find that there's a spiritual connection to their poor erectile quality. And it can come in the form of abuse, betrayals, betraying their wife and the guilt and the shame that comes from it. Yeah. And so I have several spiritual exercises that we help them through to help clear up pelvic congestion and other exercises to help strengthen pelvic musculature. Because more often than not, you know, men, they go work out their biceps and their triceps and their chest, but they don't do anything to improve the muscular strength of the bulbal cavernosus muscle, the ischial cavernosus muscle, and the pelvic floor, which all contributes to uh, 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 emission of, and secretion of fluids and then ejaculatory uh, force behind erections and erectile quality. So uh, addressing the issues of... Uh, the spirituality of the connectedness of a man to a woman through the act of lovemaking. It's very difficult for a man who's suffering from erectile dysfunction to fully connect with his love. Right. And that impacts the very identity of who they are. And then most of their sex becomes egoic in nature, which is what most sex is. It's either egoic or it's right. dark sex. It's just, it's, a mission. Really, it's just a mission, really. Mission. But it very rarely gets to spiritual connection. Right. And in order to have that spiritual connection to a woman, you have to clear out all that pelvic congestion. You have to have erectile quality so that the male identity, which lives in the pelvis, can connect with the female, right? And with that sacred feminine. If you follow me on this, all women want to connect. They all want to be seen. They all want Absolutely. to be heard. They want to be understood and they want to be felt and they want to be connected to. 
and, and they in- honestly want their man to lead to. And, and they do. And in order to do that, you know, they have to connect with the man. And yeah. that requires getting rid of that egoic nature, right? We are, we're all made in the image of God. We That's all right. are God because we're all made in his image. Exactly. And for a woman to connect with a man, she literally, and follow me on this, wants to be fucked into God. That's exactly right. You just read the David Data book, didn't you? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't actually. And when I, I said that, that's I what the she book is called. Connect with her very soul. Right. Exactly. That's exactly right. right. Well, well, I mean, know, look, it's, 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 book. Book. Oh, what was the book? I'll, I'll send it to you. I'll click it. It's David David Data's book. I just read that three months ago. It's hilarious. David, David. It. That's literally what it's titled. I mean, you know. But in truth, and Nick, you get the final say here, and then Rob, you tell people how people can work with you. Um, you know, I and this is through my spiritual seeking and and work and my inner work, which obviously you guys both know. I do a lot of that, and I was not this guy up until forty five. And thank God for my wife Monica. Um, but we are all nothing more than standing waves and vibrating particles of the divine mind. We are just literally spirits in these physical bodies having this experience, you know, speaking, you know, sharing our wisdom at our highest and best capacity. So like when you do realize what you just said, it it is profound because we are literally just extensions of that. We're extensions of God as spirit form in physical bodies and people have to get to that place. And I know a lot of people haven't gotten there yet. You know, I know in my life, Nick knows this, Rob, I think I told you this, you know, I've been an atheist an agnostic, the aliens, you know, I, I mean, I've been at all. I've I've gone down every path and you, you eventually get to a point if you do enough work where you know that like, this is way bigger than us, man. And something amazing created all this. So mm-hmm. Nick, you get the final say, dude. Yeah, no, I, the only thing I was going to add on top of uh, Dr. Rob's is, it's interesting. If you go into any ancient culture, you know, it's said in many different ways, worded different ways. But fundamentally, the, the joining of the masculine and feminine is, is a holy act. And for it to be fully achieved, it, it can be life changing for people. But both parties have to do the work before you can actually open each of yourselves enough where you can fully make that connection. And when you do, it's never the same. No, exactly. And, and 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 until you do, you just don't know. Sometimes you just can't understand what other people are referring to. And and I certainly couldn't. And when I achieved that, because there was a point in time when I gave up on my faith, you know, where, where things were just really, really dark for me. Of course. And I think we all get there at some point. Yeah. And then yeah. Yeah. some some way, I found my way way my way back, and have been climbing ever since just ascending, ascending, ascending. Right. And uh, boy, when you have that kind of spiritual experience with another human being, nothing compares. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. All three of you guys, we're all children of the light, as I call us. And we're all now spiritually connecting once again amongst each other. And we're pushing out the same information from a dissemination standpoint that everybody's, it's all the same. It's like, It's like this energy of this planet, the energy and frequency of earth right now is connecting all of us in ways that we really can't comprehend. And so I will say this to you guys right now. I've done literally probably close to 700 podcasts in my life right now. I think this was the best one. I already said that to you guys in the chat. We covered a lot of ground here. Uh, A lot of people hopefully will see this. I can't think that YouTube will delete this. They will heavily suppress it. (laughs) But we didn't say anything that the algorithm would say, that. Nah. Like, uh, you guys were both amazing. Rob, if people want to work with you, they listen to this podcast, you're going to have a lot of people coming to you to get them off of DHD inhibitors. What is the best way they can do that? Uh, simply reach out to support at Renew Health and it's R-E-N-U-E health.com. Beautiful. Nick, um, how can people reach you, my brother? <laughs> um, what is the best way to reach me right now? <laughs> Uh, actually Jay, through twitter or just go to a seer custom jay's got me locked up in the basement making oxano right now so you know you'll, you'll have to get in line he literally asked me the other day he's like dude i need help with my social media i'm like no you're not going to be dealing with that demonic sorcery that's my deal i will take care of it you have no idea how bad that is at itself but no honestly both of you guys i love you guys i appreciate you guys 
a phenomenal, profound podcast. I will be reaching out to you. I have to run right now. Nick, I will call you. Rob, I love you. Thank you. We will talk very soon. You guys have an awesome day. Thanks, gentlemen.